according to the cloud. And we, are people seeing the recording sign on so that it's yep, actually working? It's showing up. Great, thank you. Okay, welcome everybody to the second of these uh, online uh, music notation community group meetings, but the first one that we have had as, uh, as part of the W3C TPAC annual conference. Let me just, I will be muting everybody. I think everybody's already muted. Almost everybody's muted. I'll mute everybody. And if you want to uh, discuss, just unmute yourself. But let me, I tried to mute everybody. But that's, okay, there we go. So everybody except me is now muted. Uh, oh, this is, you know. uh, so again, our first meeting as part of the W3C annual conference. And because we are part of the W3C uh, TPAC meeting, we do have uh, some folks who aren't members of the music notation community group. So there'll be a bit more of introduction than usual. We have, uh, let me just get to the agenda. Uh, so we'll be, be presenting more of an introduction to the music notation community group to give people a background as to what we do and how we've been doing it over the past few years. We'll then discuss a progress update since the last meeting, um, Music XML 4.0, Smooth 1.4, and our documentation system. Uh, our MNX specification update of uh, current ongoing work, new possibilities for community group work, planning for in-person meetings in the future as uh, pandemic uh, allows, and then a Q&A session. Um, I'm not sure I introduced myself. I'm Michael Good. I'm at Make Music, VP of Music XML Technologies. We do Finale and Smart Music, and I am the editor of the Music XML specification. I'm joined here by my co-chairs, uh, Daniel Spreadbury and Adrian Holovati, who are the editors of the Smooful and MNX spec respectively, and they'll introduce themselves when they present this. And a good question about what the expected meeting length and time is. And the expected meeting length is, uh, we've booked this for two hours, but we have about an hour's worth of presentation material, we think. So there is plenty of time for discussion um, as, as we go along. So uh, there's a general thing for Q&A at the end, but please, as, as we're doing the present uh, presentations, feel free to, uh, to ask questions as we go. And I'll be looking uh, both in the chat window and the, and the participants window for people raising their hands, but I think we'll be small enough here that we can just uh, come in and talk. If, if not, we'll, we'll get more formal with the, uh, with the hand raising as we go. So that is the agenda. And I'll move out into the introduction of what is the Music Notation Community Group. We were founded uh, six years ago, July of 2015, and we develop and maintain the formats and the language specifications for music notation uh, or notated music used in web, mobile, and desktop applications. So this involves maintaining and updating two standards that preceded the formation of the community group, the Music XML Notation Interchange Standard and the Standard Music Font Layout Specification, but also developing a new specification, which we call MNX, Music Notation Extended, Extreme, Extravagant, uh, whatever you want for that X in the acronym, to handle new use cases and technologies that neither Music XML nor Smoofle uh, handle uh, by themselves, and in some cases, uh, handling use cases that Music XML in particular was designed from the beginning not to do. So it's not something where you can just update Music XML to make things work better. You really need to have a new specification to include and, and support the new use cases. I was looking at a couple of days ago, we're now the eighth largest of the W3C community groups and based on the uh, dashboard of activity, we're the 14th most active, which is I think pretty impressive for such a niche uh, area that we're in music notation software not being the largest uh, industry sector by far in the uh, 
uh, in W3C organization, but we have a lot of activity going on. Uh, and at the end there is the link to the community group. So to describe more of the standards that we're working on, we're not just working on music notation software standards, because lots of people have, lots of organizations have music notation software standards. The IEEE has their music notation software standard. ISO has their music notation software standard. MPEG has their music notation software standard, but none of those standards were developed with music notation application developers and none of those standards are actually used in practice today. Music XML and Smoofle, on the other hand, were developed by people who are both musicians and music notation at music notation development companies, music notation developers designed for developers to use and thus are widely supported. Music XML is now supported by over 260 different web, mobile, and desktop applications, which includes basically anything that you're, you're looking for in music notation, notation editors, digital audio workstations, music scanning or optical music recognition, music practice applications, music analysis and theory applications. Uh, if you search on Twitter for music XML, you will find a bunch of Japanese users using music XML to communicate uh, between their different singing synthesizer software. So that's a big thing in the Japanese market for music XML at the consumer level. Uh, there's a lot of software for converting scores into braille representations or talking score representations for access to the blind or the uh, visually disabled. So lots of different applications using music XML. And we released the new version of the spec, music XML 4.0 in June of this year. And I'll be uh, discussing more about the new things in that spec later on. Now the standard music font layout is more recent than, than music XML. So it's not used by quite as many folks, but it is still getting a lot of good take up and adoption. It is now supported by most of the ma major music notation editors, including Dorico, MuseScore, Finale, Capella, SoundSlice. It was originally invented uh, for supporting uh, Dorico from Steinberg. And as uh, there are several people on this call who were heavily involved in getting Smoofl support into Finale this year for our latest Finale release. So I'm personally really glad to see us on the list this year where we weren't uh, before as a Make music representative. But it's not just notation editors, it's also supported by Logic Pro and the DAW world, MaxScore, Verovio, other applications are using it. And now with the critical mass that is, that is happening with Smoofle, we're finding that most music notation fonts now are being de designed for Smoofle and are Smoofle compliant. There's still one major notation editor that isn't using Smoofle. So sometimes the, the font developers will then do knockoffs for that particular program. But in general, we're seeing a lot of the notation fonts being designed from, from the start for, for Smoofle. And it seems to be uh, unleashing a new wave of creativity in music font development, which is really great to see. So Smoofle, like Music XML, also had a new release uh, this year in March 2021. And Daniel will be discussing that more later on. And since uh, there, are, there are folks who are new to the group here, I dusted off uh, this chart, which I haven't shown in a few years. It was designed for when Music XML had maybe 40 or 60 applications. So it worked better then. Now it's more like an eye chart. But as you, with, with screens now, you can actually bring it out. So maybe you can read something. Uh, there on, on the chart, but if not, it'll, it'll also be captured in our video, so you'll be able to see it there. But this is what 260 applications look like. It's a lot of applications. Uh, we have a list of all the uh, applications that we know of that are supporting Music XML on the Music XML website at musicxml.com slash software, uh, but this is a graphical representation of that. So you can see there are lots of applications from all sorts of different domains currently using Music XML. So unless there are any questions that people had about the introduction to the group, let me just pause in case there are, I will then move into 
the start of what we did this since our last meeting. And if, if you, again, if questions do come up, you can either ask here or you can ask in the, in the chat, uh, looking at the chat as well. So. Uh, well, sorry, I, I do have a question. Um, I was interested in that um, statistic about how active uh, the community is. Uh -huh. um, I, and you mentioned something about a dashboard. Um, so I'm kind of new here, but um, I just get like biweekly emails from, mm -hmm. from what gets uh, d discussed. I, I understand I'm not supposed to come to those meetings. Those are just for the co-chairs, but is there some other activity that I'm missing? Like, how can I get more involved? How can I be part of that activity? If you want to help develop MNX, you'll need to get on the GitHub list for that. Um, that's where most of our activity is currently happening right now. Yeah, I will um, be. Christina is absolutely right, and we'll we'll be actually covering that a bit more later on. But most of the activity, as she mentions, is in the GitHub repositories uh, that are being used to develop the specifications, and that's what's getting picked up in the activity dashboard that the uh, that W three C is is uh, responding. Who who is asking that question? Because I, I uh, usually the, the uh, speaker pops up, but I I didn't see it there. That's me, uh, Douglas Blumeyer. Hi. Ah. Nice to virtually meet you, Douglas. You too, Michael. Yeah, so for, um, I think for what you're doing, you, you'll, you'll be interested, for instance, in the Smoofle uh, GitHub site. And, uh, uh, and I'd like to say that uh, Douglas was the, he raised the question of um, Unicode in connection with accidentals. He's interested in, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, microtone notation. Oh, yes. <laughs> so he's yes. already on GitHub. Great. If there are, are there any other questions about the, uh, the group before I move on? And I hope that answered the question, Douglas. Uh, yes, yes, it did. Great. So what, what did we do since our last meeting back in April, 2020? One of the things we did was release Music XML 4.0, which is, I don't know, the sixth or seventh version of the, let's see, we've had Music XML 1.0, 1.1, 2.0, 3.0, 3.1, 4.0. So the sixth uh, major release of the Music XML specification. Uh, major new features since 3.1. Personally, the one I'm, happiest about, I think, is the one that is listed on the bottom, which is the complete documentation on the W3C site with examples of every single element that's in Music XML. Not every single attribute, we're not quite there yet, but every single element now has an example and there's documentation. This has been asked for for 20 years and we finally delivered it with complete documentation on an open source site. It's wonderful. It was produced by the documentation system that Adrian developed, and we'll be discussing that more in a, in a couple of slides. But there are plenty of other uh, great features for Music XML 4.0. Uh, concert scores with transposed parts, is a, this is something that's been a perpetual pain since Music XML 0.1. The, uh, a lot of Music XML software would say, for instance, if you were exporting from from a concert score. Uh, you probably don't wanna do that. You wanna do it from a transposed score. It really didn't work uh, very well because it wasn't explicitly representing transpositions if they were coming from a transposed, uh, from, from a concert score. But more and more people are using concert scores with transposed parts and that limitation was getting more and more severe. So we finally addressed that in Music XML 4.0. And a big, one of the big themes was to make things work better with a combination of score and parts in Music XML, whether you call them linked parts in uh, Finale or dynamic parts in Sibelius, the terminology that MuseScore, Dorico, and other applications use. All applications these days have a, um, not all, but lots of applications have connections between score and parts and making that work better uh, is a big theme of Music XML 4.0. So, the concert score that can be used with transposed parts. The, a standard way to combine a score and all the parts into a single compressed music XML file with links 
in the files between which is the score and which, uh, which are the parts for particular part elements that are within the music XML. System level directions. There was nothing in music XML that indicated that a tempo mark, for instance, is something that you really want to appear on the top staff of any part. If you were representing a score, it'd be on the top staff of the score, but not necessarily on the part. And some applications would say, oh, it's a tempo mark, I understand, but there are other system level marks that aren't identified quite so easily that it would be hard to know should be treated that way. Now, it is explicitly represented in music XML as something that is at a, at a system level. Uh, and, and should be appearing in the, in the top staff of, of parts as well as a score. We also added some new feature, features for score following assessment and other machine listening applications. So this is something that's handy both for the smart music app that we work on, the Metronaut app from Antiscofo. It's part of the, uh, a set of features that, you know, we had been doing workarounds to get this information into uh, smart music and I'm sure uh, Metronaut was doing something similar for their app. And now there are standard features we can use. And with those standard features, hopefully that will also encourage more development in that area by providing the features. We found that as you standardize features, you also are encouraging innovation in that area. So hopefully we will see that happen as well for, for score following and, and similar types of applications. Then there are some smaller features that are still very important to uh, a lot of folks. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, my recollection is that Cyril was a big advocate for the swing playback. So I'm hope, uh, hoping Cyril is happy that we now have that working in, <laughs> in Music XML 4.0. Uh, several people were asking for Roman numeral support. Uh, we had Roman numerals for uh, analysis in Music XML 1.0, but missing some features so that they didn't actually work very well in most practical cases. So we added the features to make that work. And as we were doing that, we also made Nashville number notations, which is sort of like Roman numerals in Arabic for an entirely different use case, uh, but representing scale degrees for harmonies as opposed to uh, absolute pitches. Uh, that now is in Music XML 4.0 as well. We also have support for XML catalogs, the OASIS XML catalog standard, so that if you're looking for validating music XML and you get the DTD reference, you're not just going to grab it over the net and running into security uh, issues. You're able to specify where on your local system you should be picking up the music XML schema. And that got added in, and again, the documentation, as I mentioned before. So that's a Music XML 4.0 overview. If there are any questions, I'll take them now. Otherwise, I will, uh, after that, hand this over to Daniel for more on Swoofle. I think it is you, Daniel, for. Oh, sorry, not quite. Not quite yet for Smoofle, sorry. Music XML 4.1. I keep, uh, when I rehearsed this, I forgot that I had this slide too and I didn't practice it enough. Um, for, so, okay, we have Music XML 4.0. What about a Music XML 4.1? No current plans for version 4.1 because everything that was really, that we really needed to get into a new version, we got in 4.0. And we also find it, it's difficult to get both MNX work and music XML work happening together. We can do Smoofle side by side with uh, another of the notation specifications, but if we're doing a lot of music XML work, it tends to draw oxygen away from the MNX work and vice versa. So we probably will not be starting anything on a music XML 4.1 until we do get MNX 1.0 completed. But of course, as people use things, there are new demands, new, new ideas come up. So please, 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 if you have suggestions for a future version of Music XML, please do create a GitHub issue with suggestions for a future version. And as we accumulate more and get a critical mass and we get MNX 1.0 uh, released, we can come back around and see what we can do for a possible future version of Music XML 4.1. Any questions on that before I really actually do give it over to Dan?
Okay, on to Smoofle. And do I have to unmute? I think you can unmute yourself, Daniel. Yeah, can indeed unmute myself. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Daniel Sprebri. If you don't know me, um, I'm the product manager for, for Dorico at Steinberg, and uh, Smoofle has been my um, one of the areas of my, my focus work for a long time now. Um, and Smoofle 1.4, which we released in March this year, is the second version that we've done um, under the auspices of the, of the community group. Um, the main focus really was uh, was filling out the, the glyph repertoire. Um, Smoofle currently has over 3,000 characters defined. Um, if you're not familiar with the way the standard works, it basically uses uh, most of the of the basic, uh, the private use area of the basic multilingual plane in Unicode as a kind of repository for, for symbols. So we can fit several thousand symbols in there. Uh, we currently have more than 3,000. And in this most recent release, we, we expanded um, a number of existing ranges uh, with supplemental ranges where we had set aside a certain number of uh, code points for particular things and then found, as, as we often do, that there were additional requirements that needed to be met um, as the community let us know about them. So there are a number of new supplemental ranges um, added in this release and a couple of brand new ranges. Um, the scale degrees one is for showing the numeric um, sort of scale degrees with a little circumflex character over the top, which is commonly used in, in uh, music theory uh, texts and so on. And the techniques note heads thing is a sort of general purpose catch all for some more note heads that represent particular playing techniques where rather than having an additional marking on top of regular note head, you actually use a different different note head for that. And of course, several of the um, standard, so-called standard note heads that we would have thought about like cross note heads and diamond note heads and so on, sort of fall into that category, but have um, rather, um, they have multiple meanings depending on the instruments they're written for and the historical period and so on. Uh, the techniques note heads are more specific than that. Yeah, they're, they're particular um, use and the ones we've actually got in there are, for the time being, all related to Swiss drum rudiments, um, which is a particular uh, kind of, again, educational technique um, for teaching people how to play side drum and, and so on in a particular way. Um, so aside from adding new glyphs, the other, the other main focus of, of version 1.4 was to enrich the font-specific metadata. So a Smoofle font comes along with a font that has code points at the agreed positions, but it also needs to be accompanied by a JSON format uh, metadata file, which can then be consumed by the application that is going to use the font. And that metadata file provides lots of information about the repertoire of glyphs, for example, that are contained inside the font, um, any alternates that are there and so on. But also it, it contains a set of suggested defaults for how an engraving application like Dorico or Finale or MuseScore ought to uh, manipulate some of the default parameters for how the music is drawn in order to be complementary with the font. So for example, that includes things like how thick should the staff lines be, how thick should the bar lines be, um, and so on and so forth. And there's about 25 or so of those. And we added um, a couple of new uh, bits of metadata there in terms of the width of um, H bars, which is the sort of the thick horizontal line across the middle of the staff when you have a multi-bar rest or a consolidated rest, however you think of that. Um, and also when you're dealing with bar lines that contain multiple strokes, like a double bar line or a final bar line or a start or end repeat bar line for the font designers to be able to specify not only the thickness of those lines as a thin line and a thick line, uh, which is generally what you need for bar lines, but then also the distance between those bar lines, which previously wasn't, wasn't possible to specify. And then perhaps the most uh, useful new bit of uh, metadata is the ability for the font designer to pair their music font with a particular text font or set of text font families. And we borrowed the, um, the sort of the CSS style syntax for defining a kind of cascading list of text font families that you can use um, along with your music fonts. Um, and that was pretty much what we what we did achieve in Smoofer 1.4. And if, uh, if you want to whiz on to the next slide, Michael. Um, we do have plans for a Smoothle 1.5, but we haven't actually started working on it yet. I've got a few too many other things going on in my, in my day job um, to be able to de dedicate any time to Smoothle 1.5 yet, but I'm hoping that in the first half of next year, we'll be able to start making some progress on it. Um, 
although we don't really have a particularly fixed idea about what will be included in SMUFA 1.5, one area that definitely emerged over the course of the 1.4 development period that we weren't really able to, uh, to fully grapple with during that period was um, was to further enrich the font-specific metadata, and in particular, to make it easier for applications to know what um, optional glyphs are for. Uh, so at the moment, uh, when you define an optional glyph, you can specify which normal recommended glyph, i.e. the glyphs at the, at the standard set of code points at the beginning of the private use area, which of those it is an alternate for. But there's no way at the moment to specify in the metadata what kind of alternate it is. And of course, there are lots of different possibilities for why you might want an alternate glyph. It could be that it's one that's used by a particular publisher or a particular historical period, or it could be an optical variant. Um, and we uh, currently have the sort of notion of these sets of um, optional glyphs, which are as I've written here in, in the presentation, sort of analogs of or an analogous to stylistic sets in open type. But again, there's no way of knowing, there's no way of specifying what the meaning of those sets is. So the idea, or one of the ideas for Smith 1.5 is that we develop a kind of enumeration of um, types of optional glyphs so that we can then allow font designers when they're producing their font specific metadata to specify some kind of semantic meaning for each set um, from an agreed list that we uh, in the community will will develop and that should then make it much easier for applications that use smooth compliant fonts to actually present those alternates um, and use them in a consistent fashion uh, at the moment even dorico which obviously is, as michael said earlier on was was kind of the original target for smooth when we when we set it up isn't really able to make use in a sensible way of the optional glyphs that we've put even in Bravura, which is the smooth reference font. So I think there's some good opportunity to um, improve the richness of the metadata in that area. Plus, of course, there are still a number of um, glyph ranges that we could consider adding. Um, and as I've written here on, in the second bullet point, just as with Music XML 4.1, if anybody in the community group has any uh, requirements or ideas about things they would like to see in future versions of Smoothful, please do come along to GitHub and raise an issue and we can discuss them there. I think that's it. I don't know if anybody has any questions about Smoothful uh, at the moment. One thing that we were um, kind of wondering as we we're working through some of these things is as more of these features are added and as, as more changes are made to the specification, as well as uh, as more font designers um, produce newer versions of their own fonts to add glyphs or, or, or improve the metadata, is there plans to add some sort of a versioning mechanism um, perhaps in the metadata to be able to specify which version of font we're looking at or which version of the specification that the font is actually conforming to. Yeah, that's a good idea, Mark. I mean, we do we do have a, the ability in the metadata to specify the version of the font, um, so that you know applications can work out whether or not the you know the metadata file has been updated or what have you. But there isn't at the moment um, anything in the metadata that says what version of the specification the metadata conforms to. So yeah, that's a good idea. Please raise an issue for that in the GitHub repository, and we'll um, we'll stick that in in scope for the next version for discussion and, and probably for implementation. I can't really see any downsides to, to that as an idea. So yeah, please do raise an issue and we'll we'll stick it in the uh, in the next version when we get there. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Yes, and Jeff says in the chat that fonts themselves do have version information. That is true. Um, we could we could even make some recommendations about what fonts might want to do with some of the standard fields that are available in the tables that provide information about you know licensing copyright versioning and so on. Um, we could even perhaps recommend that that font designers do something with that data. Um, again, we try to make smoothful font technology agnostic as far as is possible. Obviously, you know, OpenType being the the main uh sort of technology that everybody's using at the moment um it's kind of natural for us to use some of the um 
open type features you know fairly directly but uh it's it's obviously something that we'd need to think about you know do we want to have our own custom table for smooth versioning numbering you know is that easy enough for developers of all different applications to use and so on uh those are things that we need to think about but there's there's certainly some possibilities for encoding things in the fonts as well any other questions Nope, then in that case, thanks very much. And I'll hand you back to Michael. Actually, this will now go over to Adrian for a talk on the documentation generator. Hi, everybody. I'm Adrian, and uh, my day job is the developer of SoundSlice, web based uh, music learning software. And I'm the editor of the MNX spec, which we'll talk about in a few moments. But uh, before that, just wanted to talk about. One of the bigger things that we've done over the last year, which is this new documentation system. Previously, for Music XML, the documentation was in a proprietary system run by Make Music, and evidently it was super outdated to the point where it was either difficult or impossible to even update it. Uh, yeah, which... it was an old version of Flare, uh, so not not so, so good. So we had the problem where we would release new versions of Music XML, but the documentation actually wasn't updated, which caused a fair amount of confusion with users. So, uh, so we had the goal of replacing that. And then also on the MNX side, uh, we were using this thing called Bike Shed, which was a uh, super simple uh, text-based documentation generator that would generate HTML from a restructured text file. Uh, but that was way too clunky for our, our liking. And we also realized if we're going to change things, it, it would be really beneficial to have both formats using the same system. So that's the historical context. Uh, we put together this a uh, new documentation system where the main philosophy is that the uh, data of the specifications, so in our case, since we're both XML formats, music XML and MNX, this is XML elements and attributes and data types. Uh, that is all uh, stored in machine readable format with additional metadata that is sort of documentation centric so the upshot is that we can edit our documentation in a pretty simple to use web app that's just a vanilla uh, django admin site for any of you who are web developers who are familiar with django and the idea is if there's if we need to make a change or in addition to the specification we just pull up that web app fill in a couple form fields, hit save, and we're done. And there are a few scripts attached to it where you can basically generate the full HTML website of the documentation and also freeze the database contents into a JSON file, which is, that's what we then check into GitHub. So uh, this took a little bit of doing, but we're happy to report that Music XML is now on that as is MNX, and the uh, all of it is open source from the raw database contents of the docs to, of course, the generated HTML. And in fact, the documentation generator itself is also open source in Python if you for your next XML specification project. Uh, so that is, uh, yeah, like I said, probably the biggest thing we've done over the last year. And uh yeah I, oh one yeah cool i'm glad you jumped ahead here so here's an example of some of the benefits of this system it uh has a whole infrastructure around notational examples where you can provide a screenshot and then a snippet of markup in the uh whatever format you're documenting so this is a screenshot of the page in the music XML documentation for the grace element. And Michael, when he was making these docs, uh, put together a screenshot of a grace note and then put together the music XML snippet of 
how you would encode that in music XML. And one thing that you can't see in this because it's just a static screenshot is all of those element names in the XML and the attribute names are clickable. So you can click on that first element measure to go directly to the web page for the measure element. You can click on uh, any one of those elements, any one of those attributes to go directly to that documentation. And everything is, is super cross-linked. So uh, it's, it's really easy to get around, hopefully. And uh, it's very uh, example driven. So if you're looking at an elements documentation, you can see at the bottom of the page, all of the examples that the system has that include that specific element and same for data types and attributes. So it's super webby, uh, which was the goal. Any questions about, oh, I see uh, Jeff. Oh, thanks for uh, posting the link in the chat there, Jeff. There's the link to the docs. Is there a URI uh, for that? Grace report. Yeah. I have a, a small question. Every gonna, element yes. and example has its own URL. And it's the system is designed in a way that will make it possible to generate the documentation for different versions of the formats. So they'll always be archived for Music XML 4.0 versus any future version of Music XML, and same for MNX. Uh, but yeah, every element has a very beautiful URL, and uh, it's it's all cross-linked. I have a yeah, question. Um, yeah. I spent the day yesterday looking at your wonderful documentation, and um, I'm wondering whether it would be possible to have a, a foldable um, display that you that you can click on the element that would then clo close it up together, so you can look at. Yeah, get an overview of the, pit, the the file. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, especially for some of these examples that get really long. That's definitely yeah. possible. It does not exist at the moment. So we would just need to. Maybe you could do it. <laughs> implement it. The one kind of, kind of sort of related thing is in this screenshot. You can see that the grace element is highlighted in blue. We do have a way of. Uh, yeah, in, in the back end, we say, hey, here's this an example. It's about the grace note, grace element. And we would like to highlight the markup from here to here just to make it crystal clear for the user to see what, you know, to highlight. Yeah, but uh, could you click the pitch um, element and close it up? Yeah, 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 yeah. I see that's what you're saying, but we don't have that, but that's, yeah, that could, could be added. It would take a little bit of doing, but yeah. it's. It's doable. You'd need to like, you have to click it. You'd have to have like a side rail or something because if you click on the pitch element now, you go to the pitch documentation, which is what you want. So, in, but you could put something in the in the left margin or something to be able to expand and contract. That would be that would be a helpful. little plus and minus boxes. Yep, <laughs> exactly. We did add syntax highlighting. Somebody, maybe somebody in this chat uh, made that request a few months ago. So we added syntax highlighting for the XML. You're not seeing it in this example for some reason. Maybe, I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe it's a bug. Oh, no, the, we, the syntax highlighting was added after we published the 4.0. Oh, right. Yeah, this is- uh, By about a week. So this is the, too late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For the MNX, that's just a subtle distinction for the music XML docs. We generated them when 4.0 was released and boom, no more updates. But for the MNX docs, they're generated anytime we make a change to the spec. So they always have the latest and greatest software updates in them. That would explain this. I should have taken an MNX screenshot. <laughs> uh, any other questions on the docs? That's that. Okay, well, let's move on to MNX. So this is the uh, the new docs homepage for MNX. It has a gentle introduction, which is probably uh, super obvious information for anybody on this call, but I uh, wanted to make it very approachable for people who, who uh, don't really understand what a music encoding format would be. 
And uh, yeah, the biggest thing that we've done over the last year is, yeah, is this docs thing. And what that involved was just migrating stuff from the old spec and along the way, adding some elements that uh, were kind of just half baked in the original spec. And I wanted to focus on a couple of interesting things. Uh, could you move on to the next slide? For those of you who aren't intimately familiar with MNX, this is intended to be kind of the next generation music notation format with a very practical yet clean uh, philosophy, I guess I would say. The idea is that we want to store the notation in the most semantic way possible. So we're separating the presentation from the actual notation information. And this is a really tricky thing because there are a lot of philosophical questions about when it comes to music notation, what actually is presentational and what actually is the meaning of it, which I'm sure we all deal with in our, in our products that we're working on. Uh, but I think so far it's gone pretty well in terms of uh, creating a, uh, an encoding format that is, is pretty, I'm not going to say militant, but pr pretty, uh, pretty strongly uh, focused on semantics. This screenshot is uh, taken from a part of the documentation that I really recommend checking out for those of you who don't have any uh, experience with Music XML, or sorry, with MNX. And that is a page that compares Music XML with MNX for, I think, like two dozen very small uh, pieces of music notation. So on the left, you see the Music XML version, and on the right, you see the MNX. And depending on the example, you can see, you can click the little radio button there to toggle between the relevant section and the full document. That, so the, the goal of this document is to give you where you are a uh, experienced music notation software developer who has a knowledge of music XML, uh, the goal of this document is to give you a nice on-ramp to MNX using some concepts that you're probably already familiar with from, M from music XML. And also hopefully to get you excited about the changes because for a lot of these examples, the encoding is a lot smaller and cleaner than the, the music XML version. So definitely check that out. And thanks to Jeff for posting the link in the chat. There's the direct link. And the philosophy for generating or for uh, designing this new format is example based. Uh, I should say MNX was originally conceived by Joe Berkowitz from NoteFlight. He stopped working at NoteFlight and also retired. So I think he got to kind of, yeah, he, he was ready to move on. So uh, I took over after he uh, retired from the game. But uh, the original idea was this, uh, yeah, semantic thing. Uh, sorry, I got uh, a little bit distracted by the chat. Ah, code folding, yes, we're still on that. If I, if I could uh, just mention the, the example that you have here, when people have asked me, well, what's an example of something that makes MNX better suited for native applications than music XML? This is usually the one that I point to is having the event structure to represent chords and rests rather than the chord element that is used in individual notes. For an interchange format, it doesn't matter which one you pick. They, you know, you can have a preference for one or the other, but they both work fine. For a native format, the music XML approach does not work fine. The, the, the MNX approach is much superior for being able to manipulate things in a DOM model or, or something like that. So this, this is an extremely well-chosen example, I think, of yeah, the exactly. M music XML MNX comparison. So yeah, upshot there is I highly recommend checking out that, that page. Uh, can we move to the next slide? So I wanted to focus on one specific thing that we've added to MNX in the last few months that I think is really cool, really exciting, and also demonstrates the, the power and benefits of the new uh, sort of semantic approach. This is 
a page of music in which you have some some relatively uh, interesting things going on. We have three flutes, uh, and in the first system, you have the first two on the same staff, and the third on its own staff, and then in the second system, they're they're split into three. Now, this is something that would not be possible in music XML. Maybe it would be possible, but with some huge hacks. But in MNX, the idea is that we encode that the idea is that this is possible. And in fact, it now is uh, as of a few weeks ago. And the idea is you encode the parts separately in the very semantic, very pure notation data part of the file. And then there's an entirely separate part of the file that has to do with the renderings, the, the, the presentation. We call that the score. And an MNX file can have multiple scores in it. That's kind of the, a key concept. And each one of those is basically a, yeah, a rendering. It's a, a collection of the parts with uh, the line break information, with page break information, and also information about how those parts are connected, if they're split, if they're joined together on the same staff, if they're split across um, multiple staffs, or if they're even excluded um, entirely. So that is, uh, I won't go into the, the details of that, but that's just, I just wanted to give you the flavor of the kind of thing that would be possible uh, with MNX. So that's, uh, this is still, there's still some uh, details of this being worked out. And I would say that's kind of the next big thing for MNX is to work out the various details specifically about uh, this working out the various tension points between storing pure data about the underlying parts of music and then reconciling that with the fact that you have multiple engravings. Uh, it's, it's kind of a classic presentation versus content separation thing as for any of you who are web developers, HTML versus CSS, kind of the same thing. You can and you can think of the the new score thing in MNX as a CSS, some CSS style rules, and you can have multiple style sheets for the same document to make them look radically different. But uh, yeah, so that's that's the one of the I think most exciting things uh, that's happened recently. And yeah, yeah, thanks, Christina, for linking to the GitHub issue. There's uh, issue one eighty five. Morning. It's really long. There's a lot of stuff yeah. to wade through, but I love James, to get people. James Ingram, I have been going back and forth for quite a while on on <laughs> how to do all this grouping. We'd appreciate a third third set of inputs, fourth, fifth set of inputs to help tie break in some of these places, if nothing, or offer us a new option that might work better than what either of what we have. Definitely, yeah. I wanted to. Uh, encourage that's like basically my main goal of this meeting for when, when it comes to MNX is to encourage more people to contribute. But I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, in uh, fact, like like, the next slide. Can we move on? Yeah, to just, the, oh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, oh, I, I was just saying that I've um, uh, I wasn't very happy when you uploaded this. Um, this was my diagram that I my first attempt, and I'm now making a new one, um, which is better and the, I think the code is better too. So I think this is going to be changed. Okay. Um, yeah, James uh, made this, uh, this and, screenshot notation. But th this, this wasn't intended to be an example for this, just for, for the, it was intended for the brackets. Okay. But, but um, I'm making a new example and I checked it yesterday against the documents. So there are quite a lot of code changes that are gonna be coming. Uh, so okay. it's coming, it's coming, but I'll be doing it on Monday. I'll be uploading it on Monday. Sounds and just good. to clarify the, the context with, with Music XML, you can represent this all in Music XML in a semantic way, but not as clean a semantic way for applications as what MNX is doing. So it's another thing where yeah, for Exchange, it works fine. But for a native application, the MNX approach is much cleaner and more powerful. I wouldn't call okay. it gross hacks in Music XML. 
Uh, all right, let's move on to the next, yeah, my... next slide. And the next, uh, the next steps with MNX are to put together the definitive list of remaining things to do, remaining to do's for version one with a, I think, hopefully pragmatic and realistic but yet uncompromising perspective on it. Uh, we want to we want version one of MNX to be usable and to meet the needs of the vast majority of notation software. At the same time, the world of music notation and coding is so complex that addressing every single edge case would take forever. So we kind of need to come up with the list of version one stuff. And then that's not the ending. That's just kind of the, the milestone for getting people to actually use the format. And then we'll continue forward. So we uh, there is a, in our GitHub repository, there is this milestone called V1. And my goal over the next few weeks is to make issues for anything and everything that doesn't yet have an issue, just uh, for the sake of putting together a definitive to-do list. So yeah, uh, let's move on to the next slide. Next steps are, yeah, that's what I just said. And yeah, the, the implementation, I mentioned this earlier, I like taking this example first approach where uh, in many cases, if we're putting together a new, uh, yeah, a new element or something, a new feature of MNX, it should start with a screenshot of notation because I think if we're, this stuff is already so abstract that personally I find it very hard to follow without specific examples of how things would work. And the, uh, the whole new documentation system has basically been designed with that as a core philosophy is that examples are good, not only for the people creating and maintaining the formats, but also for end users when, when the format is ready to be used. And next, uh, I, yeah, I didn't mention this. We have an open source utility called MNX Converter that can take a music XML file and create MNX from it. And that's written in Python. I talked about that at the last meeting a year ago. And the, the, yeah, the, the approach with this is anytime we add a new feature to MNX, we add it to the MNX Converter once, once, once the feature is kind of considered stable and, and is, it wouldn't be a waste of time to add it to the converter. So uh, down the road, for those of you uh, who are wanting to integrate MNX, which I hope is everybody, one clear migration path for you would be to use this free utility in order to uh, generate MNX from your existing music XML. And yeah, thanks for the link, Jeff. He, Jeff is all, he, he's on top of the links. Very, very helpful. And finally, how you can help. Oh, there, there's a, a question on the- uh, Oh, sorry. Is MNX converter one way or two way? At the moment, it is only one way, but I would love for it to be two way as well. And there's nothing about the architecture of the code that would prevent that from happening. It's just a matter of doing the work. So yeah, at the moment, one way, but two ways plan. And for that matter, I would love to add other formats there as well and kind of be a Swiss army knife of conversion between music and coding formats, but that's kind of a, a long-term plan. First things first, we got to get the MNX spec ready. And yeah, what's, so how, how can you help? Definitely follow the MNX GitHub uh, repo. You can sign up to get an email notification whenever there's a new issue. And that's, I think, how those of us who are deep in the weeds of MNX are, are keeping up with it. And I would really encourage all of you to post your opinions because we have a little bit of a, the, the, the community of music notation people is already super small. And we have just a small subset of that uh, contributing. I would love to get more opinions 
And even if it's just a thumbs up, GitHub makes it really easy. You can do the little emoji thumbs up thing on people's comments or on people's pull requests or issues. Uh, uh, there are some a, other ones too. I have a suggestion to make about how we use GitHub. Uh, I don't know if this is the right place to do that. Um, sure, go for it. Um, we have this, this, the current long thread is that was actually very useful to be able to talk about to, to follow a single line of the debate in the whole community. So you can read through this thread and you can see how the, the whole picture develops and you're not spread out across, across different issues. And I think it's a very good idea to have an issue like that, which is the current issue, which one can then refer to other issues, but you know where the debate is going. Otherwise we lose it, we lose your way. There's no, uh, there's no focus. And it was very useful when you made your PR request last week um, to have two issues open, one about the PR request and another one about the, 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 the continuing debate. So I'm wondering whether it'd be a good idea to have um, one issue which is marked as the current thread, um, which is the one which we are all reading and other issues which are on the side. Got it. Yeah, I, I should have mentioned there is the concept of active review it's a tag within our issue system that we yeah, try it, to keep, it's, keep it's up not, to date. It's, it's not specific enough. I think there should be one one particular issue, which is... No. Which is no. That way yeah, people I, who I, aren't interested can talk about other things. <laughs> I do think that we run the risk of having such a long and involved common thread on a lot of these MNX issues where it becomes overwhelming and definitely scary for anybody who might want to get involved who hasn't been reading the thread for the last several weeks. Um, one thing I definitely want but, to do but is you can break it up into you, more atomic. Yeah, yeah, but you can still, I mean, I, I like this, this large, this long thread. You can jump into it at a date and you can see what people are talking about at that time. So it's, it's quite nice not to be too restricted in, that, in, in the thread as to, I mean, it's, it's more creative to be able to look in, looking like left and right at the same time. But uh, I mean, do it, I mean, you're the boss. I see some head shaking from Christine. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a probably. stylistic. It's a stylistic thing. There's there's a level. There's a there's a way to do creativity stuff, and there's a way to actually decide what we're going to do. Um, and. I understand your point of view, James, <laughs> but um, there there has to be a has to be a way we can get to a point where we're not less like um, we're not talking about all the issues. We're talking about one thing that we can eventually commit, and I think that's a honestly, I think that's a generational style difference in, in the way these are done. <laughs> Sorry, I think, I, th I think the the how to group parts thread is coming to an end. I think <laughs> we will soon, know soon. very very soon coming to an end, and we will then know how to group parts, <laughs> and then we can open another one, which will be about how to um, how to what, what the structure of parts is. Sure. Uh, I see Steve raised his hand. Mm -hmm. uh, hi there. Sorry, I'm, I'm new here. Um, GitHub do discussions now. That's a feature they've added, which are are quite good for long chatty things. But that that's a complete oh, on the side. Yeah. That's a um, really good, really good point. There, I have seen that, but I've never actually used yeah. it. Yeah. So we did like look at them forum, briefly right? and, and decided not to use them. Yeah, it's basically what it is, or Slack, or something, or something like that. A sort of asynchronous chat thing. Yeah, so that might be useful for the more when you're brainstorming, and exploring things before you then define what the work package is that you're going to do, which is better on an issue, I definitely agree, with, or, or pull request. <laughs> um, no, I was just, just because I'm new here, I was just trying to understand, is MNX positioned as a, a future replacement for Music XML? Is that the idea? And Okay, I see some nods. And in that case, I would we, say so, yeah. It, it's yeah, already I'm, much better. <laughs> and it can't yeah, do half I, I the stuff that the Music XML can do. <laughs> It's beautifully um, concise. 
<laughs> I'm not an XML fan, I must admit. Not anymore. Moved on from that. But <laughs> and also, I like the idea of separating the events from the presentation. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. And yeah. then you can, uh, I mean, the whole idea is you can represent score and parts in one document by defining the parts and then defining the score as how you combine those parts rather than the other way around. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so what's the planning getting sort of buying, industry buying for this? Is, is it because people here are the people who are likely to influence that or <laughs> how does, I'm just, just intrigued um, how, having I, defined I, it and, and then getting you know people to review it <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I represent music notes we are as soon as we get anywhere closer we're going to start supporting people sending us documents um, like I've already requested time to start doing what we've already got as as an import even though nobody's going to be sending it to us yet um, so and we get we get things from everywhere like Sibelius finale, Muse score, everything um, uh, we get in to put up on our site, and we have we always have to convert it to our native format in order to make it look nice and make it downloadable again. Um, so we are looking forward to supporting MNX as being a lot less finicky than our Music XML imports are from the various sources. Now, whether they start supporting them or not, I really hope they do. Um, but if there's a music XML to MNX converter, I'm going to start using that. <laughs> yeah, that's the MNX converter is absolutely yeah, huge. That, for that does exist. Adoption. <laughs> right. Wow. Uh, but uh, to answer Steve's question about how to get buy in, I am really hoping to get help from Michael because he did the same exact thing with music XML years ago. And uh, yeah, I, th I think it's going to be a combination of working and lobbying with this group. Uh, I'm hoping that getting people involved in helping with the specification will give them some sense of ownership so they'll want to use it, of course. Uh, I imagine there'll probably be a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one sort of help, helping people. I'm, I mean, I'm happy also to write code if, if if uh, need be, like I'm, I'm hoping that MNX converter is really helps uh, as a stepping stone, also. So, yeah, and we have a lot of examples we can look at, uh, positive and negative, for technology transitions like this. You know, HTML4 to HTML5, MIDI1 to MIDI2, Python2 to Python3. Python there, three. there are lots of examples of okay, we already have a successful established standard, and now we're trying to move on to the next best thing that that sets the the table for you know because whenever you have a successful standard if you kick back and you say all right we're done <laughs> you're not and that's the no. beginning of the end yeah that's right so no, we're disrupting be... disrupting the music xml ecosystem from inside the group so that we 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 control the the evolution and the uh, of the technology and its in its future advancement so lots of lessons to learn from you mentioned some sort of Big, big changes like Python 2 to 3 and didn't mention um, XHTML and they just, uh, <laughs> that's another thing. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Isn't that part of the HTML4 to HTML5 story? Um, no, it went, it, uh, historically um, W3C who I now have joined only recently, uh, they pushed XHTML because of the, the um, uh, very, you know, the, the uh, what's the word? Um, uh, the way that it was very well defined, um, mm -hmm. but, um, but in the end, everyone wanted HTML5, which is still sloppy. I think you can you you can still get away with writing XHTML, but, you, but the validators I think don't insist on it. People mm -hmm. just found it too uh, too precise. Yep, <laughs> the semantics are too strong. Uh, so basically, the web's a mess. The West messy play. <laughs> <laughs> didn't fit. <laughs> I didn't mean to hijack that. Uh, so another thing that you should do to get, you collectively should do to get involved is make sure you follow our community blog, which gets a new post at least every two weeks when we have our co-chair meetings and, and also sign up for the mailing list. And what else? Oh, and then we sorry. move on to the next I, topic. I jumped and any uh, other uh, MNX? Questions before we move on? 
just a quick question about the blog. Sorry, I don't see that on the um, community page. I'm sure Jeff yeah, if you if, if you inside. are when you sign up for the community group, you become a member of the mailing list. Oh, okay. You know, and and the blog posts go out to the mailing list. The the blog link is the the link that I had at the beginning for the community yes. group. And there's Jeff. <laughs> but Perfect. Jeff's going to be man the man Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I have just joined. So that's great. Okay. So that's that's Thank the you. homepage that has the blog, and and then by being a member of the group, you you get access to the mailing list. But there are also mailing list links as well. It's a standard W three C community group setup. Yeah, I just wondered if the blog blog was on a URL that was public. But uh, that's fine. Thank you very much. So this is Reinhard Hoffmann from the Patient Software. Just we haven't we we are not involved. We have not spent really energy so far due to our limited resources into MNFs. So from the documentation say you, you said, Adrian, it's not yet ready for implementation. Now, given the current situation where every, every company is, um, what do you think it would be a realistic timeline of by when um, uh, the specification would be ready for implementation? Let's say, given the current involvement of people and such and such. I think you could, if you started implementing today, that would not, you, there would be no, no downside because the things that are documented now are not going to change, they're stable. So it would not be wasted effort. So it's, it's a slippery sliding scale. I yeah, don't we know might when exactly. add attributes to things. We might add more options, but the things that are up now are up. Does that make sense? They're 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 mm -hmm. those are done. They're just not com yeah, those yeah, aren't so going the, away. The, the, <laughs> my point is not that you, that the that the current work is good and so on. So basically, moving and spending more resources in the implementation in FNX would be would result in a business decision let's say and take away the resources from other areas because of some limitations in, in capacity that everybody has uh, that means uh, it is a business decision more by when uh, mnx is mature enough that not only one but also some others jump into that and get some momentum around that because so far my 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 observation is that some people do a good job many are watching and observing that like we do but all in all in terms of getting some momentum uh, it would require some uh, resources to be uh, on that on that area and that is more a business decision because those resources cannot do other stuff because increasing resources would not be uh, for at least for us, uh, not be the right measure. So my question is, when is it mature enough that not only we as a company, but maybe some others will also spend resources and energy in doing some implementation? So this is my this is the background of my dis my discussion. So if if you, what you are saying is you can do that, it's not wasted. But uh, I need to respond and say, okay, before I do that and that. There are higher priorities in our area where we split the uh, resource in those areas rather than on X M and M and X implementation. Yeah, I don't know if if I could give a specific date or timeline answer because it it really depends on your own, as you say, your own business decisions, your own your own capabilities, your own uh, resources. On my end, I. For my product, SoundSlice, I already have an MNX importer working. Uh, but I mean, everything's every every company is different. Every project is different. So you have to yeah. make a per per project per company decision on when you have the resources. When you're you yeah, know, and, yeah. from from the music. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay, so so Mike, go ahead. From the music XML history, I mean, things got, you know, it took off a lot more when there was a 
specification or when, you know, when, when it's complete. So I would think an MNX 1.0 is a reasonable time frame when things are going to be happening and what, you know, when the spec is complete and we're going in the review process to the, to make sure you, that as people do more implementations before we make it a final uh, type of thing, that's when activity will happen. When's that going to happen? We need to get the complete. That's one of the reasons to put together the complete issue list that uh, Adrian was talking about for, for 1.0, because when you have the complete issue list, then you see how much you've done, how much you have left to go and what's your rate of progress. And then we can give a better estimate of dates. The date estimate that's in the charter is from 2018. That was not quite accurate. So <laughs> let's 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 not come up with another. We don't know what we're talking about date. Let's let's get some data to to help drive the next date that we uh, we set. Does that help? Okay. That helps. Yeah. Any other questions on MNX before we move on? All right, let's, I guess let's move on. I'm trying to, I sometimes lose my cursor here. There we go. And we'll give this over to Daniel now for the uh, new possibilities for community group work. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, so um, obviously at the moment, the group is is managing not only Music XML and Smoothful and MNX, but we could consider perhaps taking on some additional projects. Um, and there've been two specific ideas that have that have come to us in the group that we'd like to discuss. I'll talk about the first one and, and Michael will talk about the second. And then finally, we, we also uh, would like to mention the uh, the group charter, which has remained pretty much unchanged since we, since we opened the group in 2015. And I think um, one of our group members suggested that possibly um, now that the work that the group is doing is, is really solidly understood, it might be, it might be a good time to think about uh, making some changes to the charter. So anyway, to talk about the instrument data stuff. Um, so this was an idea that was brought to me um, and then I passed on to the group by Daniel Ray of Musical, who would often be with us today, but I don't think he's in the, is in the meeting today, although I know some of his colleagues from Musical are here. Um, the, uh, the idea behind this as a possible area of work is that obviously music notation applications, one of the many domains of, of knowledge they need to have is about musical instruments. And they need this knowledge for all sorts of reasons, whether it's for determining the correct playback sound or what clef should be used or whether a note is in range or not and so on. Um, and so all of this data basically has to be re-researched by anybody who wants to build um, a music notation application or an application that even really has anything to do with with musical instruments um, and of course you know musical instruments are a complicated field uh, there's entire academic fields of research dedicated to historical research into the development of instruments and taxonomy of instruments and all the rest of it so although the data is none of the data about what instruments are like and how they work and so on is private or secret but there are relatively few um, good comprehensive sources that would allow a software developer who was interested in building this kind of data to find this information um, in, in a timely fashion. And, you know, all of the main applications, whether it's Dorico, Finale, Sibelius, MuseScore, and no doubt countless others, have to some degree performed this research task from scratch um, in order to build up their own uh, database of information about musical instruments. And um, as I've written here, obviously then there's, there's errors or inconsistencies or omissions, and they're different across every different application. And, you know, in general, there's just a huge duplication of effort, which is, which is not, not really something that we, that we should do, especially for something that is, after all, modeling or providing information about real world artifacts that, you know, there are thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who have this knowledge and even some books about it and so on. But why can't we, why can't we get this data into a structured form that all of us could use? I'm going to skip on to the next slide, Michael. So could we help solve this problem? Um, the Music Notation Community Group could have a new specification for instrument data. Uh, we could develop some data formats that would be easy for applications to either consume directly or structured data that they could um, import into their own existing formats, um, perhaps existing data that already exists for 
software products like Dorico, Finale, MuseScore, Sibelius, and so on, maybe the developers of those products would feel like contributing that data. Maybe we could have a big free-for-all where we look at, you know, how Finale thinks about a violin and how Dorico thinks about a violin, and we could maybe come to some agreement. Uh, and I think having a centralized um, project for this could potentially mean that um, some of the errors and omissions and inconsistencies that exist at the moment could be fixed up because um, it would be it would be possible to bring in experts who really could say, oh, well, you know, the crook on the horn is always like this in horns of this key or this era or whatever. And then we could get uh, we could get that expert data centralized and um, it would then also be easier for new data to be to be added and shared uh, across all of the different applications. Uh, there's one more slide, please, Michael. And so the, really the, the question now that we pose to the group is, does anybody else in the group feel like I do that this might be something that would be uh, valuable um, and that could be beneficial to, to developers, not only today's developers of notation software, but also, and other musical software in fact, but for future um, developers of, of music software, particularly given that at least acoustic instruments, obviously the new ones come along every now and again, but there are hundreds of them that exist and are not really likely to change a huge amount. So there, there could be, I think, a decent amount of value in, in providing um, this data in a format that can be easily used. Um, so yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please. I'm, I'm, I, I do not have a mus musical background other than a long time in choir, and I now work for a music notation company. <laughs> I would love to know more about instruments than um, a choir person would ever learn. Um, so that would be a great re source of reference for me so I can figure out what I'm actually trying to, needing to pay attention to in some of these things that I'm, I'm having to develop for. Thank you. Yeah, and I, th I think that um, a database of that sort would be ideally integrated into MNX as well. So uh, we need it for XML, MNX. Yes, I certainly think there's obviously with, you know, I, I meant to write on the slide and didn't, but um, obviously Music XML, for example, already contains a very lightweight uh, bit of additional data, for example, that, that says, what is this instrument, you know, what's its sound ID effectively, and Music XML has, a, has an enumeration of 300 something, how many is it really, Michael? More than oh, it's, I guess. it's at least 700, I think. Yeah, sure. A lot Different, of those uh, are percussion and ethnic. Indeed. Um, and so that that would be a decent, you know, that's one data point that we could start from. And again, you know, Dorico has got a database of over 600 different instrument types. Um, I'm sure that Finale, Musical, Sibelius have similar or, or maybe greater numbers of, of instruments in, uh, in at their disposal. Um, so, well, I mean, it sounds like at least there's, it might be worth exploring this further. Um, so I think perhaps what we'll do is, um, maybe put together more of a proposal and maybe maybe I will reach out to some of the people that I know are sitting on some of these troves of data and ask them whether or not they would be um, willing to contribute it to the to the project um, if assuming we we can get it off the ground. Um, I'm also not opposed in principle to acting as the editor for this um, for this specification as well but if anybody else in the community group has a burning desire, to, uh, to to step up and, and provide that um, um, uh, you know service I suppose. Yeah. Jer <laughs> Jeremy the, sounded like group. he might he might be a volunteer saying in the chat he's had to compile this data at least twice in his career and really wants to participate. So yeah. no asking for no commitments here, but <laughs> yeah, I mean I'd love to discuss with you, Daniel, what the level of commitment on an editor uh, would be. But yeah, I could be the editor or co-editor of such a thing. That would be that would be fantastic. Yeah, and I think, as I say, as my, or as Michael says, there's absolutely no no binding commitments being made here because we would we would need to. Um, I mean, coming onto the the in, uh, the charter in, in in a little while, but we'd obviously need to you know set it up as a proper project and and all the rest of it. But uh, I'm I'm glad to hear that the community thinks there there could be value in this as as I do. So um, yeah, well that's great. We'll take it forward from here. Um, and we'll figure out uh, what the next steps are. We in the co-chairs group, we'll, we'll talk about a bit more in our next meeting, and then we'll come back to the group uh, to talk about it some more um, soon, and, I hope. And Andrew has a nice suggestion here about uh, working with musical instrument museums online for musical instrument information, which sounds like oh, a promising excellent. 
promising uh, point. And it occurs yes. to me that this project might be a way to entice both new instrumental players and composers to join the community group because they want to either contribute to or benefit from this repository of data. Yeah, that would be great too, of course. Uh, the more, more people we have in the group, uh, the better. And I have a feature request for that already. If we, I don't know if this is beyond the uh, what, what the type of database this would contain, but um, having like images that could be used uh, for, I'm thinking all of, you know, GarageBand where they show the instruments and they just have a little icon. If we could have standard icons, that just seems like a, a lot of wasted duplicate, duplicate effort as well. Yeah, that would be wonderful. I mean, I know that it's it's very difficult to get a hold of of good quality imagery for these things. Again, maybe um, Andrew's suggestion of working with the Musical Instrument Museums um, Association or organization or online, whatever it was, maybe they perhaps have some some images they might be willing to contribute if we reach out to them. I think it would be obviously great. Yes, I remember what, a long, long, long time ago when I was in the early days when I was at, at Sibelius and we started work on the product called Sibelius Instruments, one of the most difficult things to do for that product was to get a consistent set of imagery. And that was really only dealing with standard orchestral instruments. And we ended up licensing the line drawings from Andrew Stiller's Handbook of Instrumentation, for example, which is one of the sort of good sources of, of data about instruments that's, that's around. Yeah. Um, but actually, for example, it would be great to be able to have some sort of an icon and a line drawing and a photo, for example, that would be amazing. Um, so yeah, well, I think there's the, I'm glad that, that people are, uh, are interested in this. And I agree that would be great, Chris, if we could, if we could achieve that kind of extra data, maybe even a sound recording would be fantastic as well. I mean, just to, just to sort of get everything covered off. Um, but yeah, great. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm very, very pleased that that's been met with um, enthusiasm by the group. Uh, has anybody got any other questions on, on yeah. that for now? Just a suggestion from Jeff on including musicologists who are focused on instruments in development of this, which, yeah, that would be a good idea. Definitely, yes. Are there any cool. other questions? Okay, we will. The, the one that I've, um, oh. <laughs> I'm currently working on something like this for finale right now is uh, uh, an inclusion of what the score order would be. For these instruments yes great um, point you know, yeah, especially when you start been... getting into some of the uh some of the world instruments and the ethnic instruments that typically aren't thought about but it'd be nice to know okay, where do they really need to go absolutely so. and that, that's presumably going to be quite a tricky question to answer because i bet you there aren't many examples in published repertoire of of you know every instrument that we might want to include in this database um that we could use as an example so again that could be something where we could maybe agree a kind of set of principles maybe in discussion with musicologists or or people who are involved in i don't know orchestral management or something about what might the factors be in how we make those decisions because you know would you do it based on oh well it's an aerophone so it should go with the wind instruments ah oh, but it's got a conical bore so it should go with the brass instruments and all these sorts of things um so yeah i think there's there's a lot of potential um fun and games to be to be had in that area too and yeah hopefully having yeah. a sort of centralized project for this would draw the right kind of expertise that we would need to be able to answer those questions certainly i don't know how to answer that question yeah, yeah Jeff. <laughs> and, and similarly i'm faced with that um you know working on dorico as well so yeah as jeff mentioned score order does vary it varies across publishers it varies across types of repertoire so uh, jeff was saying that might almost be another database but no need to no need to decide that at this point. Uh, something no. to, to include in the exploration. Absolutely. And Jim mentioning uh, Music Brains having a whole list of instruments, thousand instruments with English language names, descriptive phrases, and unique numerical identifiers for each. Wait, so. does that mean that what we want to do already exists? <laughs> I suspect that it doesn't contain all of the information that we need, but it might be a great data source to help mm -hmm. us scope out the size of, of the database that we're, that yeah. we're thinking about. Here, yeah, I, I believe yeah. it is a data source, uh, a, a checklist of items to, to start filling out. And also, I believe the unique numerical identifier could be quite valuable. Indeed, yes. I wonder what that identifier is intended for in, in Music Brains. Obviously, some kind of metadata. Uh, uh, music usage, brains, in general, one of its purposes is to provide a unique numerical identifier for everything, for musicians, for works of composition, for recordings. Um, just it's a it's a name for things so that if you are talking about 
a thing and I'm talking about a thing, we can tell if we're talking about the same thing or not. So um, if you call it a bass flute and I call it a baritone flute, but it has the same numerical identifier, then we know we're just talking about two different names for the same thing. Yeah, Very different good. different languages as well. Great yes. idea. Localization okay. does need to be a factor on these things too. Yep. Absolutely, yes. And again, I dare say we've all, um, those of us who are working in commercial development have probably spent a decent amount of money over the years <laughs> paying people to try to come up with um, localized names for a lot of these instruments. And again, I think that would be, it's the kind of thing where, you know, again, probably all of us just have a single person in each language that we ask, and they're not necessarily going to be the expert um, to really know, ah, oh, well, you know, bass flute in F is, is called diff something different in German to bass flute in E flat or whatever. Um, I know those aren't real instruments, don't at me. But um, yeah, we can hopefully get, get, uh, get all of that consolidated as well and it, it should save money and time and and improve access for for everybody and, and crucially also users of the of the applications as well because it would be consistent um uh, which i think yeah. would be a big benefit daniel the talk of localization just sorry to take this uh, aside here but um was there any talk about getting the descriptions and smoothful uh localized in, in some kind of uh, common location that we could all share <laughs> yeah do you know we've never we've never really thought about it chris um to be honest uh maybe maybe that is something that we should think about and maybe it's something we could even you know make use of trans effects or something to allow community translations to do it's a good idea could you raise an issue for that yeah. in the smoothful repository and we'll, we'll maybe do. think about that as a 1.5 thing as well i don't don't really know what we would you know what we would need to kind of munge out of the json files to make a trans effects data set for it but i i bet it's doable and maybe we could maybe we could then find some volunteers who'd be willing to take on some of that work that'd be great if so sure just great to idea toss in an analogy the common locale database repository the common locale data repository of the unicode consortium is kind of analogous to what we're talking about as an instrument data set and the way they gather that is they have a an application that asks questionnaires of various people who speak various languages and records their answers in a big database so it's not just a document that a few people come in and edit it's turned into um, probably hundreds of contributors and an application that collects um, structured information from those hundreds of contributors in various revision waves um, as they update the database so this project could become big if we want it if, um, if we let it <laughs> if we let it if it doesn't consume us all cool okay that's interesting i'm not familiar with that but i'll, I'll read up on it thanks for the Thanks for the yeah, and then there are more links also to music brains and wikidata in the chat so we will the chat again will be recorded along with everything else so we'll be sharing that great we'll move on then to the other proposal that that we received which is uh projects in the area of non-western music notation now, in the charter for the music notation community group, we talk about notated music and we explicitly did not restrict the charter to Western music notation or common Western music notation or, or anything. It was for any, any type of music notation being used in, in applications. However, all the current projects that we have focus on Western music notation and music XML and M and X are very much common Western music notation, smoothful, branches out more to um, older styles of Western music notation, but still very much from a Western focus. So the question came up, what about non-Western notation, uh, for instance, various traditional Asian music notations? Now we already do have several applications that take music that are, are for Asian music notations for Kodo or Shakuhachi, other types of notations, and they either read or write music XML files, but that's not the same thing as having a format that really is based around the semantics and the understanding of, of that music. This is more translation or, uh, of, of the Western concepts into the Asian, uh, into the concept of a particular Asian type of notation. So what, what about expanding that? Uh, my initial reaction to this is that that's a great idea if, we have the experts who can guide 
such a project. And by that, not just experts in the particular traditional notation, but in software that uses the notations. And today, I, I mentioned, you know, there are several pieces of software that do those types of applications, but there aren't anywhere near as many as to the best of my knowledge in the, in the non-Western notations as there are for the Western notations. But so as there gets to be more critical mass of that, I think the, the issue becomes uh, more uh, something, something that is better that, that we can address. But with the, the, current, the current membership of the group, I don't think is, is well equipped to do that. But if we get more, you know, and that's somewhat of a chicken and an egg thing, perhaps in terms of standards and, and software, but I think uh, it's not anything that we would exclude. We, do, we don't exclude it from the charter, but we would need to get demand from the people who are using the notation and who are building software for the notation. And if they're looking for a place to do standardization, I think we would be happy to, to be that type of place. But it's outside of that, I don't see us initiating that type of project without that type of support from, from the experts in the field. If there are uh, comments, questions, suggestions about that before. Yeah, um, I brought this up on, on the public list. <clears throat> uh, I think we should get MNX1 out and that MNX1 will have a schema that um, will have commonalities to um, other kinds of notation. Uh, I think that Asian notation is not very different from uh, Western tablatures or from, uh, I mean, they, they, have, they have complex symbols which are not very different from our chord symbols, which are put together sort of ad hoc. And then also not very different from, from ordinary tablature symbols, which are also sort of put together in a, in, a, in a kind of ad hoc way. So I don't think it's very far away, but I don't, I don't think it's very far away from, from what we are aiming at. Um, and that what we are doing should be a good basis for when we do move on to that. Um, so, but mm -hmm. I agree with Michael that, that we, we can't do this without the experts the, in the Asian notations themselves. I mean, I'm, a, I'm not an expert on that. Yeah, it's a great point. And, and uh, again, I, I certainly agree with let's get the MNX 1.0 stuff done first before right, we, right. we yeah yeah we, we I mean, tackle I think, anything I think, like but this. it needs to, it needs to go into the long-term um strategy of this mm -hmm. group that that at some point we, we need we need to attack that well we don't i mean we only need to do it if the people who are building yeah yeah, yeah the right. software in the mm -hmm. area want that problem solved because yeah, well, it's think, not something where yeah, we're going to impose our but, no, okay. but I think we already set in the, ch the charter lets us do that. Yeah. Okay. So we don't really have any like long-term strategy in the, we have, here's our well, general yeah, area. We're not, we're not ruling our it current out. Deliverables. So, yeah, yeah, we're yeah. not ruling it out and it should be on the horizon. Great. Right. Sounds like we, we are in agreement here. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Any other comments on, on that? Uh, yeah. And, and Jim mentions that there are a lot of, uh, musics that don't have a strong tradition of notation, exactly correct. But there are others besides Western music that, that do have a notation culture uh, uh, to the best of my understanding. So that would be good to, to eventually move toward. Which brings us as we have two new projects to uh, updating the group charter. This is another issue that uh, James raised uh, very uh, correctly. The way the charter uh, currently reads, which we haven't touched in years. Uh, we say we're working on the area of notated music for applications, and our current deliverables are, you know, Music XML, Smoofle, and MNX using a three-year-old, uh, uh, at least a one-year-old description of MNX from a design that we changed at our meeting last year. And it also says that we aren't going to work on anything that isn't one of these deliverables, which is something that's very nice there to, to keep us on track uh, on, on what we're trying to deliver. So it seems like this may be a good time to update the group charter because we have the interest in the instrumentation proposal. Um, 
which would need to be added as, as, as something, as a project we could work on and deliver a spec. And also the MNX description is out of date and confusing. So when people come and they see the references to the MNX container and general MNX and common Western, it doesn't match what we're currently doing and, and it, should be, it should be clarified. So wanting to see if there is agreement in the group that this is a good time to update the charter to clarify our current work. And it seems that we are interested in uh, potentially adding a new project. So we would do that as well. I see a, at least one thumbs up uh, in the uh, messages. Any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of surprised that the charter goes into so much detail or so explicit that it can go out of date, that it's not just a, a sort of general, uh, where we kind of work on this kind of stuff and then we can sort of have a lot of freedom within that i'm surprised it's so um focused that it has now gone out of date well joe joe was the person who originally did the charter and i think the goal of having the specificity i mean it's it's also like w3c uh working group charters i mean those are not chartered just for a specific area but they are chartered to do particular deliverables so um, Joe was uh, chair of the audio working group and he brought a lot of that style uh, with it and, and, and working groups get rechartered every few years and they go through a rechartering process every few years. So I think that makes sense because it has, it keeps us focused on what we're going to do and makes the, the decision deliberate. There's a good question about where do I find the charter? And maybe Jeff as our uh, expert on this can get there, it's in the wiki on the group page. Um, I can also see if I can, I can go find it, but it's, if you go to the homepage of the group, um, there's a thing for the wiki and then the wiki has a link to the group charter. And although it's a wiki and everybody can edit it, please don't, that's against the charter. <laughs> we, we have a, a specific thing in the charter about how we update it. Cheryl got it this time. All right, great. So there's the, the link to the group charter. So I, th I think it's a useful exercise for us to, to revisit it every few years and, and keep that level of specificity. Um, what, how do we proceed from here? If we, we, agree, we all agree that we're going to have a new charter. What happens now? Uh, I have volunteered to be the person to, to lead this within our, uh, in our co-chair. So I will read up on what the process is for doing the revision to the charter, and then I will be following it and will announce this. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when this will happen, but we will. We probably want it to happen fairly soon, so we'll probably be discussing this at our next uh, yeah. co-chair meeting about how to proceed and put something in the in the blog post about that about how that will be moving yeah. forward. But we we have detailed instructions as to how the charter gets updated in the charter. Right. <laughs> so. Okay, thanks. Yes, uh, the musical instruments database would be an extension to the charter. That's the new project that would explicitly need to be called out in, in the update, along with updating the MNX to be up to date and removing references to music XML version 3.0, I would somehow snuck in there. Oops, going backwards. Okay, the one uh, last topic I believe that we have for, for discussion besides a general catch-all Q&A and uh, staying in touch uh, finale is planning for in-person meetings. Uh, we found these, these online meetings attract folks who cannot make it to uh, physical events. Uh, they also, you know, we were able to record them and, and do the automatic transcription service with Zoom. I mean, Peter and uh, Peter Jonas in particular has been doing a great job of recording our in-person meetings when we have them, but the Zoom meetings uh, are very nice. We want to plan to continue them, but man, uh, uh, over the past two years, I imagine a lot of you are like me. I'd really like to see uh, you folks in person as well as uh, through the Zoom chat. So we'd like to resume in-person meetings too. And it seems like a lot of people are thinking that springtime next year is going to be a good time to resume meetings because we have like four things to choose from. 
in springtime next year that are uh, that seem like relative events, uh, relevant events, if we want to continue as we have in the past to associate an in-person meeting with an event. Historically, our most successful meetings have come at Music Mesa in Frankfurt, which will be April 29th to May 1st uh, this year. So a three-day session. Music Mesa it has advantages of being centrally located, uh, relatively inexpensive to attend. It's like 30 euros and we get great AV for free, uh, which, which we can't do at NAM. Um, the only thing we have to pay for at a Music Mesa meeting are the refreshments for the reception. And we've been fortunate that member companies have been willing to volunteer to, to sponsor that. So it, there are a lot of people in Europe in developers. So it, it's, attract, it, it's, it's nearby a lot of folks. So that has worked well. The NAM show in Anaheim, we have had a few meetings there this time they're moving it's usually in january it's been that didn't look good for a large meeting taking over the entire anaheim convention center so it's been moved to uh early june uh in anaheim there we don't get the av without paying for it so we tend to be in a small room and without a mic and stuff it, it tends to be a little bit more awkward but it's a big show and it attracts a different group of people than we have, obviously, in a, in, a, in a European show. However, you know, those are both industry events, and we have had requests, uh, the, hey, have you considered, you know, hosting at a, a more academic-oriented event? So the two that seem most related to the work of our group are the Tenor Conference and the Music and Coding Conference, and I've put the dates for, and locations for those. Tenor will be in Marseille. Uh, in May 9th to 11th, Music and Coding Conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia and Canada on May 19th to 22nd. So uh, are there opinions on uh, the whole issue of in-person meetings and events that might work better for folks? Again, we're not anything that we are planning to make a decision on here, but feedback from the group either now or uh, communicating to us uh, after the meeting, after folks have had time to think about it, would be helpful for planning, planning out what to do next. Are there still call-in options for the uh, in-person meetings? Uh, generally not, because the meeting hosts are hosting it in order to encourage attendance at the meeting. So we we have not, and and also the Wi-Fi connections at NAM and Music Mesa are really shaky. So it, it, it tends not to work so well. Might be more, more feasible at the uh, academic conferences. I haven't tried to organize at, at those. But again, we've, we've had video recordings. So there at least is the ability to see what happens after the fact. We have a couple of fo folks who have expressed more likely to phone in than any of the in-person meetings. Not getting a lot of, uh... if folks want to think about it, I mean, it's something that we can discuss. We can put together a poll. Uh, I am pretty sure that, out to the group. that um, Music Notes always makes a, a showing at NAM. So one of us would be there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also pretty sure that I am only going to be able to make it to one place. I assume we're not going to be associating with all of these. No. Um, <laughs> um, so that's that's what I've got. Other than that, it's not honestly particularly up to me. <laughs> it'd yep. be up to it'd be up to Tom Nauman what would be the best one of these to go to mm -hmm. um, to decide where what what would be the best from ours. So um, and. He unfortunately had an emergency this morning, got called away. Oh. Um, he's like taking an emergency two days off. So mm -hmm. I, I, he hasn't given us more details than that. So I hope everything's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I'm always interested in overseas travel. So I'd love to do Marseille. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> um, uh, but that's as far as I can promise from our side of this. And if I can't make it to whatever it is we're doing, I would call in. Mm -hmm. So... Michael, as far as you know, um, is MMA meeting 
at, at that time at NAM or? Uh, don't know, probably, but I, okay. I don't because the that meeting is usually in January. So that might just That's turn into I, a virtual meeting. I do not know. Okay. I only bring that up because I wonder if there might be some overlap or people interested from that group and things like the instrument database, stuff like stuff like that, that mm -hmm. could be consumed by, you know, uh, that broader category. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there's generally not the huge, there's some overlap, but not the hugest overlap between mm -hmm. the MIDI manufacturer so, or currently the MIDI association, the rebranded name. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and our group. But. Okay, it's something to, to think about. There's no need to be uh, deciding anything now. Uh, perhaps we'll, we'll send out a poll on this in, in a few weeks or months to. Uh, probably more like weeks than months because we do need some advanced planning on this. So, and, you know, knock on wood that these events actually do happen and that, that it'll be safe for people to, to travel to them. Uh, there's certainly a lot of folks betting that springtime is going to be good for resuming events. So having, moving on. Having, oh. having one more thing, having hung out in both music XML lists and the music encoding conference, I detect a little tiny bit of um, a sense of competition between the music XML world and the music encoding MEL world um, on both sides. And the interesting thing about having it at music encoding conference would be to kind of put that in the spotlight. Um, on the one hand, it could be very interesting to see um, how each camp reacts to the other. But actually, um, more seriously, I don't like the, um, I don't think that the spirit of, of reflexive competition is very helpful. And I would love to see um, the MNX group forthrightly want to be a good partner and neighbor with the MEL world. Um, so actually that's an argument for seeing if we could host something at Music and Coding Conference just to get the different communities to talk to each other. And I'm aware that's that there a are, really good point. <laughs> I, I'm aware that there are um, people on this meeting here which represent cross fertilization, um, particularly Andrew. Um, so I, there are people who are working to keep that cross fertilization going, but I think more of it would be good and um, more explicit cooperation would be good. Thanks. So that, that concludes the prepared things we had. Are there any questions? Uh, Andrew mentioned that everybody is welcome to MEC. Uh, so echoing, echoing your point there, Jim. Any other questions for the community group for things that we didn't cover? Things that you just thought of a question about a previous topic? I think Jim is raising his hand. Um, apropos of the what I just talked about, cooperation, um, for the work I want to do, I'm interested in generating a corpus of content, and I don't want to have to pick between formats. So I am really interested in converters, and I'm also really interested in seeing particularly MNX and MEL try to find ways to um, work in tandem. For example, um, each standard is got a list of examples. It would be interesting to see the examples done in the opposite group's notation and opposite group's format, um, partly to see where there's gaps and partly just to help with um, conversion between the two. And it would be lovely to see MNX converter go both directions and between all, become the Swiss Army knife um, that it, it could be. Um, so I am, yeah. I would say in more concretely, um, to the extent that a feeling of reflexive competition emerges, I would suggest that's not helpful. And in fact, we should try and find ways to um, reverse that by explicit forms of cooperation or um, cross fertilization. Um, and I realize I can step up and, and there's work to do and, and I could be one of the people to step up to do that work. And so that's my challenge to myself. Um, but I would like to see that more generally and more explicitly. Yeah, right on. I especially agree with the converter, your, your uh, vision on the converter there. That's 
very much in line with what I'd like to do with the very early at this point music XML or uh, MNX converter. I would be interested to know if we could add if somebody would be willing, because I don't know how, to add what the our MNX by examples examples would look like in MEI. And then they're no longer MNX by example. They are just how to encode this in the various language pa languages page. Um, um, it just has all, it would just have all three of them in there. If we can make it less us centric and more, hey, this is how you, how you do it. Um, that would be awesome. I, I would caution against expanding our specific if somebody wants to do that in their own document using our open source tools that is great but there are hundreds literally hundreds of formats out there yeah, so true. our spec i think should cover what the music notation community group produces but to take the open source tools that we have and put together some of a more you know comprehensive examples would be wonderful I've had a similar thought along the lines, along the same lines, when it comes to the capabilities of specific notation programs. How do you do nested tuplets in Spalius? How do you do it in this app? How do you do it in here? Is it even possible in this app? And so on. And it's kind of like the MNX examples page, but you would you would get instructions for every notation app. Maybe, maybe like a help file kind of thing, or maybe just a, can it handle this yes or no thing. But yeah, there are so many ways of slicing and dicing this information that personally, I have a, I have a deep personal interest in. It's perhaps not 100% in line with this particular community group, but uh, I'm definitely game for talking about these ideas separately with anyone who's interested in it. And Andrew's mentioned on the chat that Verovio can uh, do conversions already from music XML to MEI. So that's probably the main, the main software that is somewhat bilingual at, at this point. So we need to add the conversion from the opposite direction. Most of these we projects are, you know, so yeah. <laughs> they are, they're volunteer. I, I am keenly aware project. that every time <laughs> I open my mouth, I am, um, I, I'm, I'm giving myself another thing that I could step up and do. Yep, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you are, Jim. Thank you. Well, we are just about out of time. So let me just get to the last slide. Um, Thank you everybody for attending. I think this has been great discussions. We covered a lot of good topics and have some good direction for our future work, both ongoing and new projects. And again, for those who have joined us who are not already members of the community group, we invite you to join the group and uh, follow along, contribute to the progress of the specifications. So the link has been posted also in the, uh, um, in the chat, but go to the community group page and click on join or leave this group. If you are working in the area of music notation, uh, please join as a representative of your organization because that means that you're making a commitment for IP on behalf of the organization, not yourself. And that is legally what we need for you to be contributing to the uh, efforts of the group. Uh, if you have questions about that, just, just contact me because sometimes that community group sign up is not the uh, most user-friendly thing in the known universe. So if there are any issues, just reach out to one of us. And again, the technical work, as we mentioned, largely happens on our GitHub repositories. So if you're interested in a specification, uh, get a GitHub account if you don't already have one and follow those repositories. Those repositories do not have things going out to the mailing list because otherwise we lose all the people who are generally interested in things and not specifically interested. We, we try to keep the mailing list uh, relatively low traffic. We send out the co-chair uh, meeting minutes to the mailing list and there are announcements when we have events like this, but uh, we generally keep that uh, free. So as I mentioned, we, we post the co-chair meeting minutes on the blog and that gets sent out to the mailing list as well. And those meetings happen on 
an every two week basis. So these are really the ways to stay in touch and to participate in the work of the group. So unless there is anything else, yeah, it's about time to wrap up. Huh, right on schedule for a two hour meeting. It was, I know Michael, you like taking photos. Did, oh, did thank you, you for the reminder. Yes, <laughs> let me stop screen sharing. Stop my share. And then I need to remember how to do this. If, if, if folks who want to be in a picture, if you don't want, that's fine. But if people who want to be in a picture can turn on your camera. And... Let me first switch on the light because it's getting dark here. <laughs> yes, Reinhold is, is in the dark there. Uh, so we'll wait just a second for Reinhold to switch on the light. No, no, and I see I... 17 people who have their lights on. So let me make sure I can actually do this screenshot thing here. I, I think I'm doing the right, uh, that wasn't the right. If anybody else wants to take a screenshot and then post it, that's awesome. I am for some reason blanking out on, there we go. There's a screenshot, just a second. Okay, one, two, three, everybody say eight, no, no, everybody say notation. And let me take one more. I can remember this. I think everybody now is fitting up. This is a smaller meeting than we had last time. So get everybody in. Again, one, two, three. Great. Okay, thank you for the reminder, Adrian. Of course. And we will see you folks uh, in future meetings. And again, all this will be recorded and uh, uploaded to our site. We'll, we'll distribute where all the materials are once those are prepared. I see one new message in chat and Jim has taken a couple of screenshots too. Excellent. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. We will see you in the future. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.